Is it in the public interest to have free education for all? I would say yes, and I'm sure most other people would say yes. Is it in the public interest to ensure that large corporations pay for their fair share of tax so we can fund the, uh, the education? I say yes. So that's how we will look at every issue. Is it in the public interest? Regarding what you say about, uh, you know, you give jobs to friends, well, that's been happening since time immemorial. The only way around that is to actually have government-owned enterprises where people are employed, take up an apprenticeship or a job on merit. That's the only way around that. In private enterprise, it's not what you know. In many regards, it's who you know. Okay? So I don't think we're going to get rid of that, but we can ameliorate that by actually, and that'll be part of our policy structure within that picture, is, is it in the public interest to have public enterprises to provide essential services to the community at a decent price? And the answer would be yes. Is it in the public interest for the corporate sector not to pay tax? And if you say no, well then this organisation is for you. Is it in the public interest that more and more Australians are having difficulty accessing accommodation because they haven't got the disposable income or a good, well-paying job, as Mr Hockey keeps telling us, you know, to afford a one-bedroom unit somewhere. Is it in the public interest that people have to wait three or four months or a year or two to receive not emergency care but important care, like a hip replacement, waiting pain for so long, while they could get the operation done in a private hospital next week because there's no money, because the corporate sector is not paying tax? So that's what our policies are about. It's in the DNA of the organisation, putting the public interest before corporate interest. Is it in the public interest to get a new people's bank? Is it in the public interest to not sign a treaty with Indigenous Australians? Is it in the public interest to continue to treat asylum seekers and refugees in the manner we are treating them? Is it in the public interest? And that's where our policies stem from. Deregulation, privatisation, corporatisation, and globalisation. These four words encapsulate what's happened in Australia in the last 40 years. What is deregulation? Regulations were introduced during the heyday of the Australian working movement in order to protect people. Regulations were introduced at work in order to protect people's safety. Regulations were introduced to assist people access what is rightfully ours. Regulations were introduced to protect the environment. Regulations were introduced to ensure that people who employed labour didn't exploit that labour. And deregulation means removing these protections which have been built up over generations of working Australians fighting to protect them, getting the state to protect them by introducing legislation in Parliament to protect their interests, to protect them from being exploited from the banking sector, from the financial sector, from their employers, from the state itself. And they talk about freeing up the economy by removing all these regulations that have protected us. And what it actually means is it removes those protections which have been built up over generations to ensure that our children and our grandchildren enjoy what we enjoy. That's what deregulation is. The next thing is privatisation. What does privatisation mean? Well, between 1854 and 1975, a number of assets were created 
which were theoretically owned by the Australian people through their taxes, through their blood and sweat and tears. Things that were basically that were felt to be too important to be left to the private sector, like telecommunications. We had telecom. We had the Commonwealth Bank. We owned our ports. We owned our airports. We had in Queensland, they even actually owned a whole chain of butcher shops in the 20s, the state, in order to provide reasonably priced meat to people because they couldn't actually get access to meat. Now, everybody assumed we had our own airline, Qantas. And up to a few months ago, we had our own private insurance company, Medibank Private. Those of you who have got the disposable income to buy private insurance. Now all these, and then on the state level, you had gas, electricity, energy sources, all owned by the state government. And all these assets have basically been given away, in the majority of cases, at bargain basement prices to the corporate sector. Not because they were not profitable, and most of these corporations were profitable, and the profit that was made went back into the, into the uh, public revenue through, through taxation. But what happened is these organisations were destroyed for ideological reasons, because the main value of having a public asset and a private asset working in the same space at the same time is that the public asset acts as a break on what the private asset can do. For example, when the Commonwealth Bank was privatised, not only did people lose the income that came from the private, uh, from the Commonwealth Bank and the government protection, because it was a government bank for your, for your income, for your money you put in because it, it was a Commonwealth Bank, but they lost the power of competition. You can pass all the rules you like to regulate the banking sector, but if you don't have real competition in the marketplace, they just work together. It's a little bit like petrol prices. Petrol's, you know, 137.9 cents in Hastings. Yesterday it was 137.9 cents in Bendigo. Yeah? It's the same for the banking sector. So when you privatise, you sell a government-owned asset to the private sector, you remove that element of competition and you have no mechanism by which to regulate the private sector. And that's been a very important ideological concern of both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party post-1975, is to deregulate, privatise the economy. This is not just in Australia, but around the world. Because what's the first thing, what is the first thing they've asked the Greek people to do who are burdened with debt? privatise their public assets. But what corporatisation means is that large corporations whose only responsibility is not to you and me or the nation state or the government of the day or their superannuants, you know, all the, uh, all the people who've got money in, you know, uh, in uh, superannuation funds which invest on the, on the stock market, their primary responsibility is to increase their profits irrespective of the human, social and environmental costs. All you've got to do is walk out of that door to see what corporatisation means. You've got McDonald's, you've got Subway, you've got Woolworths, you've got Coles, and the list goes on and on. Try to find a hardware shop these days, which is not owned by Masters or Bunnings. Try to find you know, a, uh, a grocery shop that is not owned by one of the big three, trying to find a petrol station. So what corporatisation is about is about allowing corporations to dominate the marketplace. And what that means is that it removes competition from the marketplace and makes it much more difficult to access goods and services independently. Do you know that 67 per cent of all tax revenues still comes from pay-as-you-earn taxpayers? 
that some of the largest corporations on in this country pay voluntary taxation. Mr Murdoch, who's a master of owning communication networks, received an $876 million refund on the eve of the 2013 election. And when Mr Hockey, the new treasurer, was asked to comment, he said no comment. News Corporation and Foxtel, which is the other arm, sorry, 21st Century Fox, which is the other arm of the Murdoch conglomerate, are on the ATO's, on the top of the ATO's watch list as tax avoiders minimisers. 21st Century Corporation pays 0.75% tax legally on its profits. Aldi, we think, pays less than 2%. IKEA pays 3%. The Australian-owned Dexis Property Group, which has over $21 billion in prime residential and commercial real estate, pays 5 per cent tax. Google and Apple pay less tax combined than an individual taxpayer earning $150,000 a year. And you, that's what corporatisation is about. It's about them using their power to hobble our political representatives. You may have the occasional inquiry, which the Greens and the Labor Party pushed through the Senate, which was opposed by the Liberal National Party, but when it comes to real action being taken to ensure that corporate Australia pays its fair share of tax, there is no action. There is no legislation. And there is no legislation because political parties, as we've seen, are financed by private donors. And apart from the Greens who refuse to accept corporate donations, what actually happens is he or she who pays the piper calls the tune. So every time somebody talks to the major political parties about introducing a new tax to regulate or regulate corporate Australia, nothing ever seems to happen. And we've recently seen, which I thought was very funny, we've seen the honourable members from the Liberal Party and the honoured society, the Calabrian Mafia, coming together for their mutual benefit. But where was the outrage? There was an outrage because some councillor, some Labor councillor, you know, in the city of Moreland was involved with the Mafia. But where was the outrage regarding Amanda Vanstone, the minister at that particular point in time, giving a Mafia captain, not a soldier, a Mafia captain, a ticket to get out of jail for three and stay in this country, there's no outcry. And it's because corporate Australia pays the piper. And the Labor Party understands this and the Greens understand this, because every time they come up with an option, for example, a 1% stock market turnover tax, the creation of a new People's Bank, a new Commonwealth Bank, the, a financial transaction tax, or, or getting $35 billion by taxing the top 10 per cent of superannuants you know, at a reasonable rate, getting $35 billion a year. Nothing ever seems to happen because Parliament, the power of Parliament, has been usurped by unaccountable corporations. That's what corporatisation means. Now, globalisation is a particularly nasty piece of work. It's about opening the Australian marketplace to overseas labour. 457 visas were introduced in this country not to fill a knowledge gap. They were basically introduced to bring in semi-skilled labour in this country to put downward pressure on wages, and we've seen no wages growth in the last 15 to 20 years, but more importantly, to destroy what was left of the trade union movement after all the legislation that's come in to make striking illegal, except, say, during an enterprise bargaining agreement period. So that's what 457s were about. And we've now got tens of thousands of 457s. Now, I've got nothing against people who are trying to earn a living, but you would think 
that when we have underemployment among young people, when we have no job security in this country, when we have minimal education post-secondary or post-tertiary education in terms of learning skills, which has been given to the private sector, you would think that the responsibility of a government would be to protect the interests of the citizens and residents in this country. So that's, that's another issue. That, that's what globalisation is about. It's about breaking down the borders for foreign labour, foreign capital, foreign businesses. And we've seen this is not just a problem for Australia, it's around the world. So these are the four things that have happened, and they've happened on our watch, and we have allowed them to happen, and the Australian people have allowed them to happen because they haven't protested about it. We've been blinded by the consumer-led recovery. So what if we got cheaper cars but no Australian car industry? So what? If you can buy bread that's made in Italy on your supermarket shelf and you don't have apprentices for bakers. So what if you can go to Kmart and get a $3 top because some poor Cambodian or Bangladeshi you know, worker is getting a you know, dollar a day, if that? I mean, that's what's blinded us, is this unadulterated consumerism it seems to have blinded the Australian people to the reality. What is the reality for the 25 million people living in this country? One million own a second home. One million Australians own more than one home. Extraordinary, isn't it? We're told that 38 per cent of people own stocks and shares in this country, mostly through superannuation funds. But then when we look at the legislation which drives people to these ways of earning extra income, you begin to see that hard-working people who pay their taxes, obey the laws, don't protest, do the right thing, are basically considered to be fools in this country. They're treated as disposable garbage. Think of the 40 per cent of Australians who rely on social security benefits to survive on a daily basis. The richest seven people in this country own more than the poorest 40 per cent. Isn't that extraordinary? You'd expect that maybe in India or Bangladesh, but you wouldn't expect these type of figures in Australia. And the dilemma is we've allowed this to happen. We have allowed this to happen on a daily basis. Every day we've let the ball, well, I'll use an ashes analogy, go to the wicket keeper. Every day we haven't actually thought about it because we got those cheap clothes and that beautiful widescreen TV and all that garbage we can watch on Foxtel if we pay for it, and the list goes on and on. And it's worse because this has been brought at the future of our children and grandchildren because we won't pay the price. We'll die be remembered for a few weeks or years or months and then forgotten, but they will pay the price. We're told that young people today can't get job security. They have to work three or four jobs in order to survive. And you all know that with your kids and grandkids. And I'm sure most of you here are helping your kids and grandkids in some way. And without your assistance, they would find themselves in a difficult financial situation. That an ordinary home in an ordinary suburb can sell for more than a million dollars. It's all very well if you own two or three homes. What about those Australians who will never be able to own a home? You'll be forced to rent. And if you think rent's cheap, think about how difficult it is when there's an era where there is no public housing, no money goes into public housing how difficult it can be to rent. 50, 60 per cent of the social security benefit goes to rent a one bedroom dump in the middle of nowhere. And this is a reality for an increasing number of Australians and for an increasing number of young Australians. And people talk about increasing family violence and people talk about increasing violence in the community 
increasing friction between different group, groups in society. And that's a dilemma, because we as Australians have always blamed the outsider, the other, for our dilemma. Whether it's the Muslim today, last week it was the Indigenous Australian, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, the week before it was the welfare bludger, you know, then you had the disability pension bludger, that was a new one that came in last year. It's always the other, the person who speaks a different lingo, the person who's come from another country, the asylum seeker, the refugee. And this is what we're seeing in Australia today. We are seeing the rise of political and social movements which tend to divide us every day. They divide us as Australians and as people living in this country. They divide us on the basis of religion. They divide us on the basis of sexual orientation. They divide us on the basis of gender. They divide us on the basis of whether we're welfare recipients or whether we you know, are, are working Australians. So there's this fear that's created in the community and people don't see the wider picture, the dilemma, the reason there is no money every time we ask Governments are asked at the state or federal level for improved access to healthcare services, public education funds, public infrastructure, public housing. We're told there's no money. We've got to tighten our belts. There's no money. And if the coalition government had a majority in both houses of parliament, we would have unemployed youth waiting for 26 weeks, 30 weeks, half a year before they got unemployment benefits. We would have a GP co-payment introduced in this country today. We would have a number of quite obnoxious laws introduced if it wasn't for some of the crossbenchers. But we're told every day there's no money. Obviously there's no money. When corporate Australia acts as if they're living on the top story in the penthouse, throwing crumbs to the rest of Australia, you begin to understand why there's no money. I mean, who are the heroes today? The great philanthropists, the Rupert Murdochs of the world, the sharp corporate money men and women, the CEOs of corporations. What's happened to ordinary people? Now, I know our friends received Order of Australia medals, Nanette and Brian, but they should have received the top honours. 40 to 50 years of community service. Who receives the top honours every year if you look at the, at the, at the honours list? It's always, there's always one or two politicians and one or two corporate leaders. Who are the great heroes? The philanthropist. What is the philanthropist? A rich person who doesn't pay tax, who decides that they're going to help somebody else, but only the deserving poor, not the undeserving poor. I mean, What's so heroic about being a traitor? Rupert Murdoch gave up his Australian citizenship so he could actually become an American citizen to expand his business empire. What's so great about having a tax dodger and a tax minimiser as the, you know, one of the great heroes? The, he pulls the parliamentary strings, the puppet master, because we have allowed them to own the means of communication. 76% of all newspapers are still owned by Rupert Murdoch. Television, they're going to move in the next few years into television. If this government is re-elected, I can assure you those cross-media ownership laws will be removed. Why do you think there are continuous attacks on a really reformist, mild-mannered ABC? Because the ABC is eating into their revenue stream. There are only five people in this country that own almost 98.9 per cent of all media outlets in this country. So you get the hypocrites, and that's what they are, hypocrites, telling us to tighten our belts, making people like me, a bulk billing doctor who have been, I've worked for 60 hours a week for the last 40 years, looking at some of the most disabled people on this planet, and I am now going to be forced out of business by a government who thinks bulk billing doctors are scum and criminals. I mean, that's the type of society we've become. Look at all those lawyers who've worked in community legal centres 
for a modest wage. They could have made tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in private practice. They have been squeezed out of the community legal centres, so there is no legal representation. And the thing is, we have allowed this to happen on our watch. We have been waiting for a messiah or somebody to do something about this. Most Australians belonging to two tribes, and those who listen to me know there is the, the Gunner tribe, I am going to do something about this, and there's, there's somebody should be doing something about that tribe. Well, you look around and you say, tut tut, that is terrible. Somebody should do something about that, and then you get on with your business. My message to you today is we, we are the people we've been waiting for. We are the people we've been waiting for. It's not the media that's going to do your work for you. Rupert Murdoch and his henchmen and women are not going to do your work for you. It's not your local political representative who's going to do your work for you. Because your local political representative will only work on your behalf when he or she fears you more than they fear the power that unaccountable corporations exercise over this society. The Liberal National Party and the Labor Party believe that the way you increase revenue is to increase population growth. That's always been their policy. While John Howard you know, funded a he funded against asylum seekers and got re-elected on that basis against uh, Mr Kim Beasley, he doubled the immigration program. Now, I've always been of belief that an immigration program should be uh, revolve around asylum seekers and refugees, because I believe they make excellent residents because they've got nowhere else to go and they tend to work hard and become part of the community relatively quickly. I also think family reunions is important. But in terms of bringing in people because they've got certain skills, my belief is that we should educate people locally and we should actually be self-sufficient in terms of the type of, uh, uh, type of things we do. I mean, why do we need to import welders? A factory down the road employs 250 men. They still manufacture. Five or six years ago, what they did is they got rid of all their factory staff, went overseas, interviewed 10,000 people, brought back 250 on the understanding on 457 visas. These were welders. These were not, these were semi-skilled workers. You could learn it in a, you know, six months or so or three months. Everybody else was chucked out the door because it's cheaper because they're non-unionised. They don't complain. And if they behave themselves, they'll be given Australian residence after three years. Now, I've got nothing against people coming over, but what I detest is corporations using their power to bring people over to make us strangers in our own land. Now, Alan will tell you what it's like to be a stranger in your own land. I mean, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders lived on this continent for 40,000 years, and they were wiped, almost wiped off the face of the planet within a space of 30 to 40 years. Big business wants us to be a low-wage country, to have working poor like they have in the United States where people can work their butt off and still not meet their commitments. So but what, what we want is a different type of society where people, if they put in a decent day's work, can actually look after themselves. And I don't believe we need huge numbers of economic migrants to do that. I do believe we have a responsibility uh, to people who are dispossessed, to asylum seekers and refugees. 50% of the immigration intake should be asylum seekers and refugees. I mean, I mean immigration intake. So it is a big t but They want more people to increase revenue and have a labour of, a pool of cheap labour. I graduated initially from the University of Queensland in 1975 as a MBBS. We had 198 people who graduated from that class in 1975 for a population of 2 million people. In 2002, for a population of 4 million people, 
there are only 100 graduates from the University of Queensland. And that occurred because it's cheaper to bring in a trained doctor from overseas than it actually is to train people. And that same philosophy now goes to uh, telecommunications, anybody with any particular skills, and even people with uh, skills like soldering, um, you know, boilermakers, they've been brought construction workers, and you'll find the CFMEU, this is something they've been campaign, campaigning against. Because these people are not brought because we care about them, they're brought across because to increase revenue in the country and to put a downward pressure on wages and to destroy the trade unions. That's the only basis. So you don't have to use the word race to be against a big Australia. There are people in society who will use race or religion or whatever to blame that. That's not our issue. Our issue is basically the economy and the well-being of the people that are here today. Young people come as we grow because ultimately it is about them and their future. We were a skill-based economy and to have a skill-based economy you need to train people, especially have a, a throughput of young people coming through. What we are now is a service economy where we're basically selling things to each other. I mean, that's, that's the main thing. You can get a massage, you can get your coffee, you can get your breakfast. It's a service economy which has some skills, but the skills are minimal. You, you can learn in three or four days. Skills where it takes money and time because the private sector is really not interested in training young people. They have no interest in training young people because it's a long-term commitment and they can rely on four, five, seven visas to come across and do that work or uh, through the immigration system. So what you are seeing is a increasing pool of dissatisfied, angry young men and women who are basically sitting at home playing with the internet, getting involved in uh, a lot of activity, which, uh, you know, drug taking activity, uh, who really, there is no pathway for them. If you go to university, there's a pathway. But once you get pushed out of university, you're still pulling coffee for somebody because there's really not a lot of jobs. But for a lot of young people, there is no pathway once they leave school. So it was easy for the PMG and telecom and uh, the, uh, SEC to take on apprentices because they had a long-term vision. It was paid for by the government, for our, not by the government, by our taxes. Let's not forget, public enterprises are paid by our taxes. And we were, merely, as a people, willing to make that commitment. We're no longer willing to make that commitment because we want the cheapest priced article. We, we, our, our, our mentality has changed. It's a consumer mentality. When we go and look for something, it's always the cheapest article that we're after. If that means there's no apprentices, then so be it. Big things happen when small groups of people come together to change things. And that's the message I want you to take home today. You don't need massive organisations. For example, Everybody thought the Eureka Rebellion finished in 1854. It didn't. It reverberates 216 years later. For example, in 1855, the 13 men who were charged with high treason, who were facing execution, hung, drawn and quartered because of high treason, were found not guilty by a jury of their peers. Within a year of the Eureka Rebellion, the leaders of the two major leaders of the rebellion, Mawla, who was part of the Forceful Action Brigade, and Humphreys, who was all about peace and love, were both elected to parliament. For the next 10 years, there were two parliaments in Victoria, which people know nothing about. There was a parliament in Spring Street and across the road at the Eastern Markets, where the Southern Cross Hotel used to stand, which is now the Ministry of Justice, there was an alternative parliament of rebels who put a lot of pressure on the Victorian parliament. Victoria was the first place in the world which in 1872 under Premier Heels, who Heelsville is named after, introduced free, compulsory, secular 
education. We were some of the first people in the world at the turn of the 20th century who were involved in major change. Well, I break up Australian history into three segments and I'll go through these three segments because I think it's important that we understand what is happening in this country because the people who don't know their past will never be able to determine their future. The first period is 1788 to the 3rd of December 1854. This is the period of colonisation where people like the Bunurong who had lived here for 40,000 years across the whole country was forcefully dispersed. Their lands were stolen, they were murdered, raped, they weren't allowed to speak their languages, they were totally dispossessed. From the 3rd of December 1854 to the 11th of November 1975, when Australians were looked up to around the world, because not because of our war records, but because of the social innovations that working people had made in this country. The development of a viable trade union movement which represented working people's interests. The development of a social security system which was the envy of the world, where we understood to be Australian meant that we not only looked after ourselves, but we looked after each other. And we had this introduction of some of the most important social security things we have seen. Intr introduction of pensions, the introduction of single parents' benefits, the introduction of workers' compensation, the introduction of a minimum wage, the introduction of you know, security in many regards, and the ability for one person working in, in a family to actually own a home within seven to ten years of normal everyday work. So we were the envy of the world. And that happened not because governments gave it to us, it happens because people organised. Some organisations crashed and burnt, some continued till today. But people organised. They believed they had the power to determine their future. And we had things like the People's Bank, the Commonwealth Bank established in 1911, the first Labor government elected in the world, the Watson Labor government in 1910. But these things happened because ordinary people got together and fought for them. There was a lot of suffering, but they worked together collectively to change things. For example, after the defeat of the Great Shearer Strike in 1891, the working class movement moved to form the Australian Labor Party to represent their interests in Parliament. And within 20 to 30 years, there were Labor governments across the country. What I can do is grossly limited. What I can do with other people is stronger. What I can do with a mass movement, what we can do, not we, me, what we can do as a mass movement is the world's our oyster. But the trouble is we have to get there. And these little community meetings are about setting the seed. Some goes on fertile ground, some goes on you know the rocks and never grows. Right? This is fertile ground today. Unless you're one of the one million who own a second house, or you're one of the five percent that's got more than a, a million dollar in your superannuation fund, you're basically one of us. And we need to get more people so we can register as a political party for the next election so we can stand candidates on the platform of public interest before corporate interest. We are more than a, a political party that wants to be elected to parliament. We are a burr under the saddle. We are a ginger group. We have a skeletal framework in public interest before corporate interest. We haven't got specific policies, one to 700, all right? It's a little bit like getting an embroidery uh, picture. You know, you're going to embroider the colour into the picture, but you're not going to change the picture. So the policies may change as we grow bigger, but we don't change the picture, and the picture is very simple, putting public interests before corporate interests.
Late last year, I was invited by a few people in Frankston to stand in the state election in the seat of Frankston. And we stood on a public kind of first platform with minimal success. And at the end of that, these wonderful people in Frankston said to me, well, what next, Joe? What are you going to do next? And I said, what do you mean, what next? And they said, well, you know, something needs to be done, something needs to be organised. And that's where public interest before corporate interest was established. It came from a handful of people wanting to do something more. And public interest before corporate interest is not just a political organisation which is issue orientated. It's not just about one issue, it's about everything. That you want a different type of country. That you want to go back, not only go back, but go forward in, ter in terms of your children and grandchildren enjoying many of the things we enjoy, like three tertiary education, the ability to get a secure job, the ability to get an apprenticeship, and the list goes on and on. This is not a top-down organisation. I'm happy to speak anywhere, but I'm not happy to do any organising. Because if you've got the same people speaking and organising, you don't have a grassroots organisation. You're old. You're decrepit. <laughs> you use it. You go out there, you hand out your leaflets. You don't move for anybody. You're on a footpath. You have a legal right to be in front of Bilston's office or Bilston's office till the cows come home every day if you want to, as long as you're not abusive to people walking past. When the police come, if they ask you to move on, you say no because they can't move you on because the move on laws have been rescinded. And that's why the move on laws were put in the first place because as people like us were standing our ground, refusing to leave, exercising what few rights and liberties we have, right? They have been rescinded by both Houses of Parliament and Victoria. There are no move on laws. It's mainly bluff on their part. And you say, I'm not protesting. I am the public conscience. I am here to remind you of what your job should be, which should be to be representing my interest. I am the public conscience. And sooner or later you'll find the police will just smile at you, wave and keep walking. All right? But the first few times, stand your ground. Give your name. Give your address if they ask for it. Stand your ground. And uh, you'll find that because there are no move on laws, unless you're an obs causing obstruction, you can't be moved on. Especially if you're just handing out leaflets. You set up a table, there's issues regarding council permits because it's a permanent structure. But if it's your standing there with leaflets or a placard saying, I think Bilson is bil bilious, <laughs> right? You can stand there, if you've got the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, come and talk to me why. It's like you may, you may see some stickers on cars in the old days that say, I'm not insured with Amy, ask me why. You say, I don't support Bil Bilson, ask me why. We're involved in political activity and standing candidates, that's what we'd like to do. And secondly, we're involved in, as I said before, non-violent direct action. And that includes things like protests, strikes, petitions, vigils, and community boycotts. One was the community boycott in the southern states in the USA by black people in the early 1960s where they refused to go into shops which only served, had whites only entrances and blacks only entrances. And it was that community boycott, not just Martha Luther King and other people, but it was that community boycott which broke the uh, economic backbone of the white-owned businesses. And the second thing is, was the huge community boycott in Soweto and other parts of South Africa during the apartheid regime when blacks refused to pay rent for their properties. Hundreds of thousands of people refused to pay rents. For a community boycott to be effective, it needs to be organised effectively, which you can do through the internet. Uh, but it needs to be a widespread community broker. And I think it's a very effective mechanism of uh, getting change. The way to empower people is to give them 
the power to put up questions for referendums, and that's what's called a citizen initiated referendum. Say if 10% of the electorate uh, wants a particular question put up, it's put up and it has to be voted on. And uh, if it gets through, it becomes part of the constitution. They do that in Switzerland, and they, you wouldn't call Switzerland a radical, rabid, hot, hotbed of activity. It's a very conservative country. We're not going to just walk into a community and say, here we are, this is what we, we know the answers, we're going to do this for you. We're going to walk in and say, some people in your community, could be one, two, three, you know, are interested in our ideas, they've organised a picnic, they've organised a public meeting, we're here to explain our ideas. If you want to join, well and good. If you don't want to join, at least we spoke to you in the story. Because what we want is committed people, whether that you can help financially, whether you can help in terms of doing things, that's what we're interested in. We don't want just a membership of 500 people and an executive of you know, seven or eight people calling the shots because that's just a waste of everybody's time. Because as I was saying to people at the beginning, I think of Pipsy as a willy-willy, not a tornado, an American term, but a, a specifically Australian term, an Aboriginal term, a willy-willy. We're like a willy-willy. We're cleaning the path as we're going along. This is Jo's wife, Ellen. And she would like to start the meeting with the welcome to country. I would like to welcome you to country on behalf of my dear friend, Carolyn Briggs, who is the top boss at the moment of the Bunurong people. And the Bunurong people go from down here all the way back up and across to Geelong. On behalf of Carolyn, the Bunurong people's turn to say this is our country and you are welcome at this time. Thank you.